This year, the St. Francis de Sales members visited the Regeneron Lab, the Guggenheim Museum, and Chelsea Market. And here at the Academics and Arts Fair is me, Silas Gonzalez, and him, Charles Liga. Hello. We'll be presenting to you the three trips we went on with our definitely above-average commentary. Please click on which trip you want to hear first. Just kidding, we're doing this on our own terms. First, we went to the Regeneron Lab in good old Sleepy Hollow, New York, United States of America. The experiment we did was the Forensic DNA Profiling Lab, allowing us to fully experience the evolution of scientific technology and safety glasses. Both experiments examined a region of DNA from chromosome 16 that involved a segment of nucleotide sequence called ALU within the non-coding region of the chromosome. We started by prepping samples of our mouth DNA from cells collected from saline mouthwash. The routine for this was very complex as we had to carefully extract our samples into increasingly smaller test tubes with increasingly complicated pipettes that we then had to put into these spinning centrifuges. Once everything was finally prepared, we used this PCR machine to target our cell's locus, which helped us identify our genotype. Our lab prioritized D1S80, a highly variable tandem repeat polymorphism on chromosomes. Fun tidbit here, the FBI utilizes these tandems to create genetic profiles. Our scientific instructor on the project explained to us how even our small samples can hold vast amounts of copies and base pairs in them. Thanks Arden. This whole trip was really remarkable. Just seeing how many base pairs of DNA could exist in just one tiny swab from our mouths was incredible. In the context of this year's theme, we truly witnessed the evolution of forensic science firsthand. And speaking of really smooth transitions, it's time for me to talk about my trip. After Regeneron, I went to the Guggenheim Museum in good old 1071 Fifth Avenue, Manhattan, New York, United States of America, Planet Earth. But technically we went to the Gagosian Gallery first, which is where these paintings came from. After that quick visit, we walked the Highline Bridge to finally get to the Guggenheim Museum. We were all so excited for the exhibit because one, the museum had a super unique setup, hence the spiraling floors you can see pictured here, and two, this is where they filmed the Men in Black. Students such as Joey Roman were eager to walk where Will Smith once stood. The exhibit we got to see was by Nick Cave, the guy responsible for these insane sound suits. His elaborate sound suits and textile works had been celebrated internationally, all featured in this very exhibit. The exhibition was sectioned thematically in thirds. As our tour guide put it, the first section was titled What It Was, an area that honored early works in the formative era of Cave's life. Here's a collage of antiques Cave merged together to create a psychedelic pageantry of its own. His creative eye for things once neglected really shined here. Thanks, Angela. This is the second section, What It Is. These pieces address depression, loss, mourning, and remembrance of the marginalized communities. A truly sad section that forced us to face the injustices of our past, but culminated into joy and collective celebration of the change we now have in the future. And last but not least was the final section, what it will be. This area showcased the iconic sound suits throughout the room. Here we learned from Angela that Cave would make sound suits in response to the racial profiling and beating of innocent people by Los Angeles police officers, starting with the unfortunate incident concerning Rodney King. The acquittal of the police in that situation led to an outbreak of riots. Cave was inspired to make these sound suits as a protective second skin. This truly was an enlightening trip that highlighted the flaws yet growth of society throughout our human history. And that's enough from me, I'll let you go back to Charles and his trip to... Whoa, look, it's me talking. Alright, now, for the last trip, I visited Chelsea Market in good old Lower East Side, New York City, United States, Planet Earth, the Milky Way. On this trip, we went to various art galleries in the neighborhood. Chelsea Market has a super interesting history. We learned that in the beginning, the Algonquin Indians used the area for typical trading and bartering. The market actually started in the late 1800s, early 1900s. It opened with the start of Nabisco, the National Biscuit Company. Nabisco was the country's largest cookie supplier and was constantly growing. Eventually, Nabisco became so large that it needed to move out into bigger property to keep up with the growth. With Nabisco's move out, there was a vacancy that was not filled in the Lower East Side. 
buildings on the block were hardly interacted with, bringing the overall quality of the neighborhood down. Yet, not all bad came from this. Art in the form of the Chelsea murals are still standing to this day, as they capture the image of the time period of the mid-1960s. In 1990, the buildings were purchased for a calm $10 million by the investor Erwin B. Cohen. Cohen saved the buildings from losing all the history that they have accumulated through the shops, restaurants, and offices that were established. All these commercial workspaces are completely diverse and still open today. Chelsea Market is interesting and all, but I haven't even mentioned the High Line yet. The High Line was the train system which transported meat, dairy, and produce through the market. It's unique because of its location being above ground cutting through the city. It was used on the same level as pedestrian traffic, but this was deemed unsafe, eventually getting turned into the first elevated train track to be used and operated on in 1933. As time went on, the tracks were seeing less and less use. There were plans for demolition until the early 2000s, where the local government was convinced to turn the rundown railroad into a walk-on garden. This is another strip of New York City culture and history caught in time, preserved through our daily lives. After we moved on from the market, we went and visited the various art galleries that the Lower East Side had to offer. A recurring theme in these galleries was the style of art. While some works made sense, others did not. This all had to do with the invention of the camera. You see, before the camera was invented, artists were able to capture the image of a recognizable object in their artwork. However, when cameras started becoming more popular, artists' works would be appreciated significantly less due to their new technology's ability to capture images easily. This sparked a new type of art in artists playing with color, texture, and the feeling of their piece. These new artworks, though they may not be recognizable as images, are intended to convey emotions to the viewer. The complexity of the paintings really changed the whole era's feeling on art to a much more powerful one. And that's our experience at this year's trips. We really appreciate you taking the time to watch this video in its entirety. It means a lot to us. But we kind of have to go study for our AP tests this week. So, bye!
Welcome to the effects of art and opera in a modern world. So we as a school want to go see the opera Rigoletto by Giuseppe Verdi. And this is us entering the main part where you're going to watch the opera. And this is the stage for the opera. Now, Giuseppe Verdi's works changed the world of opera as a whole through introducing a new musical vocabulary that stretched the role of the orchestra. And the orchestra is right below the stage here. This is some interior stuff when you first enter the building to see the opera. And these are the main characters of the opera. Now, Rigoletto is a prime example of being new in an existing world because it introduced new ideas to opera that didn't exist beforehand. An example being not having the formal entrance of a long solo song that would introduce characters. And this opera specifically tells a message about vengeance and responsibility. Its characters were interesting since they showed various emotions throughout and all had different personalities. And this opera then went on to inspire others to be creative and affected operas as a whole. It did change the traditional opera by no longer including prolonged songs to introduce characters and inspired people like me to be more creative in their writings. Now, a few months later in Manhattan, we as a school went to go tour different art galleries. Here are two pieces of art that I really like because they are very interpretive and no one can really define what they're trying to say. These next two are made by the same artists who made the previous ones. And if you look closely, maybe you could see like an animal or a shape and everyone finds something different, which I really like about it. This is a different art gallery we went to in Manhattan where throughout this entire gallery, this sculpture was painted. So you had this sculpture and then every painting had this sculpture somehow. Next art gallery we went to was a huge one. It was Gerhard Richter who did change art as a whole and had a big effect on the movement. He introduced this new style that was never done before by splattering paint everywhere. And this video is going to show you a little tour of his paintings. Now, that style has effects on modern art where, for example, in some schools for art class, an assignment will be to rep replicate Richter's style of splattering paint everywhere. I left these two paintings here because they're very interpretive and show that what he did was he just splattered paint randomly. And I always ask people, what do you think they mean? And everyone tells me something different and has some certain emotion when trying to interpret it, which I really like. Thank you for watching, and this was The Effects of Art and the Opera in the Modern World.
United Nations has played a key role in international collaboration and participation which fostered alliances and unity throughout the world. The predecessor of the United Nations was the League of Nations, which was established after the signing of the Treaty of Versailles on June 28, 1919, marking the end of World War I. Its purpose was to promote international cooperation and to achieve peace and security. As of 1946, the League of Nations ceased to exist, having handed over all of its assets to the United Nations after the end of World War II, which ruined many nations. Because of this, the world wanted peace, hence fifth representatives of 50 countries gathered in the United Nations Conference on International Organization in San Francisco, California from April 25th to June 26th, 1945. Here, they drafted and signed the UN Charter, which officially established a new international organization, the United Nations, which was hoped to prevent another world war. The main purpose of the UN is to uphold its one central mission, which is to maintain international peace and security. This goal is met by its dedication to prevent conflict, helping parties in different countries to come to an agreement, deploying peacekeepers, and paving the way for international peace to flourish. It is made of 193 countries around the world, with five of those countries being permanent members. The permanent members include the United States, Russia, China, France, and the United Kingdom. It also has six main parts, which play a key role into helping it uphold its mission in order for it to serve its purpose. Six main parts of the UN in no particular order are the General Assembly, the Security Council, the Economic and Social Council, the Trusteeship Council, the International Court of Justice, and the UN Secretariat. The General Assembly is the main part of the UN. It is the only part of the UN where all of its members have representation in their annual meetings. The meetings are about discussions on important questions about maintaining unity, security, accepting new members, and financial decisions. In order for a decision to be made in a meeting, two-thirds of the representatives have to vote on whether they support or do not support the decision. As of 2023, there are 193 countries that participate in the UN by sending one representative. The Security Council's purpose is to rule out any threats to peace or acts of aggression. The Council consists of 15 members, with 5 of those members being the permanent members. The permanent members' significance is that they have veto power. This means that even if the majority of the council votes on supporting a decision, one of the permanent members can veto the decision and discard it completely. The Economic and Social Council has the, the purpose of running coordination, reviews of the UN's policies, and suggestions on environmental, social, and economic issues. It also carries out the International Agreements on Development. The Trusteeship Council is responsible for supervising 11 trust territories that had been established under, under the direction of seven member states. It also helps territories to take the steps to self-govern and become independent. The International Court of Justice is responsible for resolving legal disputes among states and give counseling on legal qu questions given to it by the agencies within the UN. The Secretariat is made of all of the staff members and the Secretary General. The Secretariat has the responsibility of carrying out the everyday work of the UN and peacekeeping missions all around the world under any conditions. This asset was passed to the UN by the League of Nations. The main building is located in Manhattan, New York today after it was agreed for it to be moved there rather than Philadelphia after its founding. 
Currently, the UN has departments and offices in New York, Geneva, Nairobi, and Vienna. It contributes to its purpose by promoting peace and security among nations, by developing diplomatic relations between them, promoting social progress, better living standards, human rights, and providing humanitarian aid through various programs. In conclusion, the world would not be the same if the United Nations was never founded. This shows that the United Nations has played a key role in, in the development of the world throughout the years after World War II. I would like to thank Mr. Ruvalo for help for sponsoring this video. And I would like to give credit to the United Nations official YouTube channel and the United Nations website to, where I cited all of my evidence from. Thank you all for listening and watching. Thank you.